Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction Book Review Podcast. My name is Luke Burridge and this is a show where I review every single science fiction book that I read as I read it. There's no set schedule, it's just whenever I finish a book I do the review, stick it up here on the podcast feed for everyone to download and listen to. Uh, this book that I'm going to be reviewing today is the third book in a series and I finished it a few days ago but I was kind of distracted because I'm uh, working on a cruise ship down in Antarctica and I had to do my show and also uh, there's lots of whales and penguins and scenery and all that kind of stuff and glaciers and icebergs and all the, all the kind of Antarctic kind of things that you think you see kind of distracting so every time I was like all oh, right I'll start doing the podcast now I was like actually no there's whales over here and orcas I'd never seen orcas before um 10 years of working on cruise ships and sailing around I'd never seen an orca before but then this morning yep pretty cool anyway so the book is the third book in the um Malazan Book of the Fallen series by Stephen Erickson um it's called Memories of Ice and from what I can tell actually though um here uh, looking on the Goodreads page it says series Malazan Book of the Fallen number three Malazan number seven ultimate reading order suggested by members of the Malazan Empire Forum number six so I guess there's different ways to read this kind of like is it the chronological order or is it the other one and uh, because when I um got into this book again. Oh, let's go back a bit. Yeah, so I read the first book years ago, probably about 2013, and the next book in the series, book two in the series, um, in 2015. Let's quickly look for it on this uh, on this uh, thing here. Yeah, Malazan, Book of the Fallen, The Gardens of the Moon, I read in 2013, and Dead House Gates, Book of the Fallen, number two in 2015. So it's been quite a gap. And I started reading this book, um, Memories of Ice, in uh, 2016, it says here on Goodreads, uh, Uh, No, sorry, July. Yeah, July 2016. And I listened to the first section of the audio book and was kind of into it, but then I kind of got distracted. It's a really big book. And it's kind of difficult to go, right, this is, um, you know, it says here, mass market paperback, 920 pages. It was a 45-hour audio book. And that takes quite a commitment. So at the time, I guess, I started it and was just like, yeah, this is cool, but not it, you know, it just fell off my uh, reading list. And it's been sitting there on the left-hand side of my Goodreads currently reading section on the home screen of Goodreads, on the home page of Goodreads for a long time now. But as I have uh, lots of uh, cruising this this winter to do and uh, uh, and lots of time, I thought, well, this is the perfect time to get through this book. And so it was. So uh, I started it up again. I went back to the beginning of the book. I didn't try and remember where I left off and uh, so got back into it. Now, the, the problem with reviewing a book like this is this is epic fantasy as at its some of its most epic that I've ever read. It's it's like it's like someone's gone okay how epic can we possibly make a novel like this is Stephen Erickson the, the author is like how epic is it possible to make a novel or a series of novels and yet still not make it too confusing like the people can still hold what's going on in the head and like and not be confused and not like get characters and not forget characters before we come back to them and it's it's so close to that that it's kind of like Uh, I know that's the thing that's most impressive about it now if you want a story which is so dense and the world building so dense and there's so many characters and you're switching around between viewpoints so much and this book is actually happening as far as I can tell from like the way that some of these match up it's happening at the same time as the second book but on a different continent there's the like the main set of characters that we're following in this in the first book and then the set they kind of split up at the end of the first book or I can't remember exactly I read it in 2013 but the bridge burners which is like this unit in the uh in the Malazan army and they uh you know they get split up and in and then second book we go off with fiddler and other people um in uh, with this sort of trek across a desert in one continent and then in this book we come back to kind of where we left off in the first book and and follow the rest of the bridge burners and Paran and whiskey jack and what they're getting up to in this book and there are a few um, characters and a few different things that I saw crossed over in between them and I think if I'd have read these books back to back or like closer than three years apart I'd have probably have picked up a few more links between the two of them but yeah this is this story is so epic that they've got to go like okay meanwhile over on this continent and meanwhile back on this continent you know that's how epic the story is but it is just so much stuff going on that like I, I was making some notes about how many different factions and characters and different sections and different storylines are going through and it's just crazy like the main thing is like okay so there's this um this big bad empire coming up the panion dome in empire and there's a seer of the panion dome and you're like okay right so that's who we're fighting and there's some all this stuff going on so that what they do is they get together the um 
the uh, the Malazan army, which was kind of like discarded or, or you know sort of cast out from the Malazan Empire, Dujek's uh, Dujek One Arms Army, and you go okay, and then there's the bridge, burn, bridge burners, and then the people they were fighting against in the first book, now they're teaming up with those things, so Anamanda Rake and Moonspawn and the Tista Andy and uh, all these other kind of things, and then the Silver Fox pops up in this one, which we had a bit in the last one in the Rivi, and then there's all of these different factions get together, and then they go right. So now what we're gonna do is we're going on a on a mission and we've got to um we're gonna face this army so what we should do is actually you know liberate this city and then head them off at this city and so the first section is well i say the first section the first section is getting these armies together and putting them together and then the next section is this Long the um, Kapustan is this. There's a city which is under siege, and I guess most books or most fantasy books will be like, okay, this is the story of this siege, and that's fine. In the first one, we had battles. In the second one, we had a big, you know, a big, you know, army trying to get across a desert, dying while being chased down by another desert, etc., etc. And this one, you're like, okay, this is going to be the siege one, but then you get like, uh, you know, just over halfway through the book or about two thirds of the way through the book, and they're like, right, okay, that's the siege part finished, and now the thing people that are left over after. To this siege, there's this other army that we came in, the Grey Guild and all that kind of stuff, and this uh, Grunt- Gruntle who's the new mortal sword of the god of war and doesn't like war, and it's Covey and has been cast out, and all this, and it's just sort of like... Th- like epic battle uh, like section which would be big enough to close one book in here it's sort of like okay that's just the the middle part of the book and now we're gonna have to go across to this other city and get these armies across to this other city for uh, the big the big real big showdown um so that's what's going on and at one point oh Moose, moonspawn has disappeared and what's happened to the dragons and there's there's ravens and there's buzzards and there's all these other kind of things going on it's it's it, this is the point. I would say it's almost too much to understand and to keep track of what's going on. But I think where this book falls v- just short of like the perfect epic fantasy is that it actually crosses that line a little bit for me. I think if I was reading this book as a paper book rather than an audio book, it would be a, li- a lot easier to keep track of who is who and where people are um you know because then you can kind of go at your own pace and there's probably going to be a map and maybe a list of characters and a glossary and you can look people up um so in its intended form this is probably one of those perfect fantasy books which is just like everything is clicks into place and everyone enjoys it and you can flick backwards and forwards between the pages and go all oh, right where's this person oh they're over here let's go back and check them out over here but as an audio book this is one of those things that, as an audiobook, I loved the performance of this. Let me quickly just look up on the uh, audio um, Audible app, like who was the um, who was the narrator of this one. Um, it is oh, it's taking a while to load up here, but it's a narrator that I've known before, and I really enjoyed his work in other times. Yeah, Ralph Lister, and he's I've listened to Ralph Lister um, in the previous books of these. I think he did the. Um, well, there's another fantasy series where he did another fantasy series. It doesn't matter which one it is, but uh, yeah, he, he's I, I know his voice. The the that when the characters turn up and they can just start speaking and you recognise the voices, it's so fantastic to like listen to the voices. And I think again, a lot of like being able to remember who's who and tell who's going on and remember who who is the bad guy here, or who's not the bad guy, all this different kind of stuff. It's all made easier by you know having someone do fantastic voices and 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 separating out but just the density of the number of characters and the number of places that they go to and everything that's going on like that does it it was a bit too overwhelming and again i'm not blaming steven erickson because he probably didn't write it um with you know it, this being an audiobook in mind but you know in some ways uh, it's saved by being an audiobook and in some ways it's maybe it doesn't it didn't all hold together because of an audiobook which is weird because if this was a paper book or an ebook i wouldn't read it because there's no way that i would commit myself these days probably to a, a 900 page novel um but a 45 hour or what is it no three 40 44 hour audiobook here um i will do that if i'm away from home for seven weeks and uh, I've got lots of sea days and no internet connection i've run out of podcasts um for the second time in the trip so that's all to say that I really, really, really loved this book. The first book in this series I gave three stars to. Um, actually, let me quickly look at this. Yeah, Malazan Book of the Fallen, uh, number one. Gardens of the Moon, three stars. Uh, the next book, 
um, Dead House Gates, four stars, and this is better than both of them. It, we we return to like the more interesting character, the most interesting characters, and kind of the more interesting storyline part of the book. I mean, the Dead House Gates was good, but it did even as I was reading it, it did feel like oh, I feel like I'm just following along with the side characters from the first book, and here we get back into the you know the main characters from the first book, which is which is really good. So this is definitely a step up from that. Um, and in some ways, it feels like a self-contained story, which is really good. I think that's the good thing. If you if you're gonna have a twelve, I think this is a twelve book um, story, like a twelve book series. Uh, but it's not just one story. It's sort of like more kind of self-contained stories told within each one of them. I guess it's kind of like the maybe more like the culture series, but less so than that because that's spread over a lot more time. But here it's sort of like you could definitely pick up these books. I wouldn't say read them in any order because it definitely helps going into it. But also I was told, you know, going into this that the first book isn't so good and then it really picks up at book number 3. So I'm glad that I got to this. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that like as I was reading this and when I came to the end of it, I was like that could have been like if you just gave this novel to someone it's like yes that's that's a book that's a, that's a novel it's epic there's a lot going on there but of course you would learn more or you'd get more out of it if you knew where a lot of these characters came from but in some ways it's great because like the main characters like this main unit that we're following are the bridge burners it's here in big book three where we get the backstory of like okay why are they called the bridge burners why is this a unit why do they have this camaraderie who is quick ben why is quick ben the their their battle mage or mage or whatever one of their soldiers like why is he so powerful like who are these other people who are coming along what's this you know these and it's sort of like ah right we get that backstory and it's only like a like a side story in one of the chapters where one of the characters is like oh okay let me tell you like who these people are and where they come from it's like oh great three books into this this series about the bridge burners and now we have the backstory of why they're called the bridge burners and why they came together um which is really great. So in some ways, yeah, it felt like it, uh, that. And in other ways, it felt like if this is... No knowing now this is a completed 12-book series, like that the, the last book is written, you know, this whole story is good. It feels like in this book, it's like, oh, this is where things are really kicking off. Because, like I said, there's all this stuff with, you know, Whiskey Jack and... Dujek, One Arms, Andy, and Anamanda Rake, and the Tista Andy, and Corlett, and Rivi, and the, the Silver Fox, and the Talani Mass, and the all these other kind of things, all these different, you know, proper nouns that I could throw out there, which don't mean anything to anyone unless you've read this book. Like, all of that stuff's going on. But in the background, or maybe not in the background, but all the time as well, there is the kind of, seems like the bigger story of what's going on with the Deck of Dragons. And this book starts off with talking about the Deck of Dragons, and that is like a, kind of like a tarot card deck where you can, you know, you put the thing, you know, put the cards down and it tells people stories and there's different houses in the deck, um, like different uh, suits of cards and things like that, and different characters, and you have this, and they start doing it, and as the... Um, I don't know, as the religions change, as the gods come into power and leave and gods die and other gods are ascendant and other gods lose all their followers and all that kind of stuff, the deck of cards that people play cards with actually changes. And I really love that idea. And I'm not quite sure, is there just one deck of dragons or is everyone who's got a deck of dragons and they flip over the cards, but why can't they just flick? So it's like this weird way that like the the gods and their um, the houses of gods and stuff kind of played with a lot within this deck of cards and it reflects it um and we had a bit of this in the first two stories actually in the first book one of my uh one of my uh, complaints was that oh yeah this one character dies and then is immediately brought back to life so maybe is that bad but it's sort of like oh no that's really kicking off the story when, when that happens to um Ganoas, no Paran. Ganoa's Paran in the first book it's sort of like you know he's brought back to life because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time and he's now going to be someone important to the gods so you understand that everything that's going on with the battles in this book is kind of just the you know the foreground action of a much bigger 
like a struggle between the gods, the elder gods and the new gods and these other gods which were around for a while and now they're coming back and they used to be very powerful but now they're coming back they're not so powerful anymore or nobody really knows how powerful they are and that's going to be upsetting the gods and this other god is coming in and it's not quite not really playing by the rules and maybe we should make this other god play by the rules so it's not as dangerous for everyone and all these different things like this is feel this book feels like where that story is kicking off and I notice that the next book is called The Crippled God so you're like okay that's a big part um or, no what's it called no i uh, i've lost the what the next book in this series of court is called but um yeah whatever the next book in this series is it's like yes this it's sort of like now the humans are doing their thing but there's this massive epic battle and again this was what it, this makes this even more epic that this would be epic if it was just the stories of the um of all the you know the powerful soldiers and the the other soldiers and the wizards and these other races these previous kind of like elf like races and the orc like races and all these other kind of things that have have come along beforehand just that story would be epic but like i say in behind all of this is like lots of maneuvering by the gods and um other powers that are all kind of playing for, you know, extra power and to keep the peace or not to keep the peace or destroy things. And the whole idea of like, oh, this god, the, the like the main bad, the big bad kind of Sauron kind of thing could just be like, like a, a boring, oh, it's Sauron, he just wants to destroy everything. But it's actually a god which was like chained and crippled by mortals in some way. I'm sure we'll find out a lot more about this and I'll remember more about it in the future. But yeah, it's sort of chained and crippled and then was brought and it was meant to be used as another weapon against something else but now it's sort of come back and is being you know unchained i'm not sure what's going to happen anyway the, the 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 other story is really kicking off meanwhile the other way to look at it it's a self-contained story and it feels like the start of a 12 book story or like it's like where the story is really kicking off three books into a 12 book overarching story it also feels like a conclusion of like a concluding book especially to the first book but also this could be a trilogy if i'd have just read these three books these first three books of the malazan book of the fallen and it stopped here and they're like yeah that's the end of it i'd be like oh right there's obviously a lot more story to go but if this was three books in a trilogy and it ended here i'd be like okay i can kind of see that obviously it isn't and it wasn't written that way but it feels like a lot of story threads were which were kind of disparate and here and there and all that kind of thing are very much brought together into this one to make it into sort of like a proper story a proper whole story which which means that the payoff is very satisfying and it's not just sort of like oh yeah this character makes it these two characters get together in the end this character dies and this army wins and this other one doesn't it's not just that it's sort of like some like bigger themes and kind of like some of the larger background stuff of like what it means for war to exist or what it means for like to have an enemy and these other big themes which are sort of like i know it's like kind of almost tried to say it but yeah this is a book which is all warriors doing warrior stuff and it's a book about war but like it's almost you know it, it's a great kind of exploration of why people go to war and i think the idea of it starting off where they're sort of like oh yeah in the first book we we were enemies but now there's this other enemy so we're gonna have to get together and defeat this other one and the friendships that come for between former enemies um throughout this book is i don't know it's just a I just find it a very impressive conclusion to what I mean of course there's more books I don't know what's going to happen after this but it feels like a conclusion to some of the themes and of course to some of the characters and some of the battles that have to be played out but there's still a lot more to go so that's kind of what it felt like um what can I say let's I could go through some of the characters as well ah okay yeah so it's Covian uh when he turned up I was like who's this idiot like he signs up and he's like i'm the shield anvil of veneer i'm very important and someone else says, well i'm the mortal sword of this good like there is a lot of very powerful people here who are all blessed by this god or they have this jo- got job given to them by this god or they're wearing this you know this armband and it's going to be important there and other people turn up and they're like no i'm more powerful than you it's like oh yeah oh yeah you are more powerful than me and other times it's all like yeah, i'm the big guy around here and somebody else turns up and it's like are you really the big guy and then lady N- Envy turns up and they're like, wow, who's Lady Envy? She's like the daughter of the God of Dragons or something like that. Again, I can't remember, can't always keep track of of who all these people are and uh, keep it all straight in my head. But yeah, so 
Uh, yeah, it's Kovi, and I made a note of him, so I like that. Uh, Paran uh, is was one of the characters who was kind of like a, oh, yeah, he's just the rich kid in the first one, and his sister-in-law is going to become the empress, and he's saving it, and sort of like a bit of a moany guy. I really enjoyed spending time with him in this book, because he's sort of, he's sort of like, oh, you're rich, or you're coming from this, like, uh, noble background, you're an officer... Uh, tell you what, you're now in charge of the bridge burners, and he's like, "Really? That is not my job. They're all—they're just going to ignore me. They're not going to listen to me because I'm just the noble guy, and there's no reason for the, me to be, you know, their leader. Except, you know, I'm just a trained officer or whatever. But I'm a young guy, and in this one, like the almost the whole well." Half of his whole whole story is him going, oh yeah, I've got to get the respect of the bridge burners, and I really enjoyed that story. His other story is all about the gods and all the other kind of stuff, but again, that's certainly not finished. Uh, that part is certainly not finished with him, about like how much power he has. We're not quite sure. He doesn't seem to have any capabilities except sort of being as a... Um, I can't remember what he's called, like the uh, the the judge of the deck of dragons. He's he decides how the rules work. Maybe I'm not sure. Like what his job is going to be in the next in this wider battle is is very interesting. Um, also, his relationship with Silver Fox, which is like a leftover relationship from someone else. I really enjoyed that. Um, I actually one of the things that I really enjoyed about this is some of the smaller characters. Um, and I think one thing that really comes out of this is that Silver Fox gets two bodyguards who were just members of the, uh, like, two soldiers. And they're, they're never named. It's just sort of like, oh, yeah, the two Marines who were there looking after her and they did this. And they become not main characters, but kind of like like viewpoint characters of what's going on and mainly it's because they they don't have any superpowers they don't, aren't blessed by the gods they're just there and they do their jobs and throughout the whole book we never find out their names and that happens quite a few times is that of like oh yeah and this soldier did this and there was this character here and we followed this character here but we don't find out their name we just follow their story and it and again it's one of those things that it, like you really get what it's like not to be you know, an Amanda Rake and controlling a flying city, a flying mountain called Moonspawn, and or being the the daughter of the the god of dragons, all this other kind of stuff. There's quite a few times where you're just spending time with like characters, sort of like, yep, this character uh, is going to be doing this thing, and then this character's over here, and there, and you just see things from that kind of smaller point of view, which is definitely needed because if it was all like, oh yes, I am now the new mortal sword of the god of war, Gruntle comes along as a of like turns into some you know uh you know personifies a tiger god or whatever he's the person on the front cover i learned as it was going through and it's a really interesting story but if everyone was that kind of super powered by gods and magic and things it wouldn't be um it wouldn't work out uh it wouldn't it wouldn't stay interesting you you need these other characters often unnamed characters to kind of uh, root you in in humanity because as we go through a lot of characters who you think are just normal people like Cropper turns up and you're like oh actually there's a lot more behind Cropper um, than you than you expect and uh, and also they have the motto regulars I, I I really hope that one of the future books don't anyone email in and spoil it for me but it, I really hope one of the books in the future follows the Mott irregulars because it feels like they're like a, another group of warriors like the bridge burners who have been brought together actually by fighting the bridge burners and the uh, and do jack one arms army in the past and you're like okay there's obviously some fun backstories and some fun characters in that group there um, I like that the Tregala Trade Guild turns up in this. They're mentioned in the Dead House Gates as well, and they turned up here. And I was like, that's one of those crossover like uh, groups or characters when they turn up here. I was like, oh, right, they, they've been over in the other book. And then I worked out, oh, no, actually, when they leave from here, they go over to <laughs> that other book. Maybe? I'm not sure. It, they come one way or the other way. Um, who else do I like? Oh. Yeah, Lady Envy, I mentioned her before. Tok, Tok the Younger or Tok the Older. This is the thing that I get look, got a bit confused about. So in this one viewpoint character, or this one like section of these characters traveling and meeting up with this army at the end, you've got Lady Envy, and then there's Tok and Tog and Tool. And these are like, why have like so like why have all these characters talk and tool and tog i think and again i'm still not quite sure and i was always a bit confused about how many people they were there there was gareth the dog i think it was gareth and then there was the wolf and then there was like three other people 
And every time we went back there, I was like, okay, let me see if I can remember which one's Tog. Well, I knew which one's Tog, but which one's Tool and which one's Tog. Um, and there was another thing as well. We'd get back to Caladan, and then there was Kalor and Korlat. And I guess if I was reading this, I'd see that, oh, yeah, Caladan starts with a C, maybe, and Kalor and Korlat starts with a, a K. Uh, and, of course, they're brother and sister, so they have, like, similar names. But then there was lots of others as well. Like, there's the Talan I and then the Talan I Mass, and some of them are foxes and some of them are zombies. And so, again, it's often a little bit too tricky for me to keep it all straight for 45-hour audio, but 900-page book to keep it all... Um, all straight in my head of what's going on there. Uh, I really actually quite, like I say, uh, I quite, uh, what I said before about the, uh, like, the crippled god who is kind of like the main god behind the bad guy, and then you got the seer of the Panindomin, and you're like, oh, okay, this is the main bad guy, but then when you meet up with him, it's like, oh, wow, this guy, not really in control of what's going on either. You thought he was going to be, like, a, a powerful wizard who's in control, and they turn up there, it's like, oh, no, everything's happening without him. And then you got the, the cannibal... Um, rapey army, the Teniscarri, which is eating its way across this continent. And there's a, quite a lot of talk being like, how is this army going to keep going? Like, the only way it's going to go if they don't resupply themselves and they're just eating their victims and eating th anyone in their army who dies and they just keep going. Like, how is it going to go? It's like, well, it's just, you know, if you just keep eating your own shit, you're not going to last very long until you, I don't know how it works out. But anyway, this cannibal army, the rapist, weirdly enough, the rapists in this cannibal army are the women. Um, the idea being, which is a, a weird idea, that the the women rape the injured and dying soldiers of their enemies and try to get to give birth, and then those the the people that they give birth to are this kind of like the seed of something something. I can't remember exactly all the proper nouns of this one, but it's like really weird and really disturbing. Um, but uh, it's yeah, it's good to see that. The, oh yeah, that's another thing. I might as well talk about this. There's this line that I made a note of as I was. I only made like two notes in total as I was uh, listening to this on my audiobook. One was Paran had never seen a cat run headfirst into a wall. It's like near the beginning of the book, and I was like, you know what? Never seen a cat run headfirst into a wall is a good way to introduce someone whose magic skills is upsetting animals. Anyway, so another character says, like, this leader of this army is sort of like, right, we got through the battle, let's get ready for the next one. I want them blades so sharp you can shave with them. And someone says, most of your squad is women, sir. And he just says, whatever, and moves on. And you realise as you're reading through this that when push comes to shove, a lot of the main characters and a lot of the characters who join up and a lot of the people who are re recruited into these armies on the fly uh, are women. And a lot of the, I wouldn't say the mo more powerful women, the more characters are women, but I really enjoyed it to be, like, just reading through this book, which was written a long time ago, that, like, when a character turns up and they say, oh, yeah, these two marines turned up or these two soldiers turned up, and another time it was sort of like, and he turned around to see how many people, how many were left in his army, and it was him and eight women were left in, or his squad or whatever it was. Him and eight women were left in the squad, and you're just like, all right, that's actually pretty, pretty interesting. It's not always explained how it all works, but a lot of the time the characters turn up and someone's very powerful or interesting character, and you'll read almost a full chapter about them, and then at the end you'll be like, oh, yeah, and that you were reading about women that entire time. And it is flagged up a few times. For example, at one point, there is a big group of powerful people get together, and they're actually like, hey, it's like a girl's night out. It's There's no guys around. Let's let's have a let's have a drinking party. And they're like, woo, let's do it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, I really enjoy reading the... Um, I, I really enjoy reading the stories where the women... The, the the men are just as much love interest for the women as women are love interest for the men and you can read a battle and women are contributing just as much and at the end of the book you know uh, like when it all comes push comes comes to shove and who's in charge of what army or what's going on over here um the women are doing uh, again not quite just as much as the men but in any situation it could be a woman in charge rather than a man in charge and i don't know it's just refreshing to read that and it's and also it's kind of refreshing that it's not even commented that much about it it's not there there isn't very much about oh we women are just baby machines but now i'm going to become a fighter and i'm going to do my thing it's sort of like nope it's just this character like, I don't want to just say happens to be a woman, but it's just one of those things that is just part of the storytelling, uh, which I find, uh, which I find quite refreshing. Um, do I have any other notes? 
Um, no, I've kind of, I mean, all I did was make notes of other people to talk about, like Whiskey Jack. Oh yeah, Whiskey Jack and Corlat, their romance. There's not a lot of romance in this book, but what there is is very effective and kind of heartbreaking in some ways. It's the same with what was going on. Oh, we're well, not the same, but it's similar to so one of the romances with uh, Paran and uh, and Silver Fox. It's this weird kind of relationship, and you're like, how is this relationship ever going to work? This is this is crazy. What's going on here? They're crazy if they think this is going to work. And then, it, of course, when it doesn't work, you're just like, oh, I really wish that could have worked. But of course, it's it, it. You know, some some things are just you know, it's just unrealistic. Um, and yeah, there was at the end of this book. It was one of those stories where you're like, oh, okay, is everyone just going to get rewarded at the end? Oh, you made it through to the end, so you become the leader of this one, and you become the king, and you do this. There was a little bit of that at the end, but as this is not the final book in the series, the ending can be, I don't know, a lot more bittersweet than other books. Sort of like, not everyone makes it through to the end, which is kind of expected in these big, chunky fantasy stories. Um, but the way that, like, whole races of uh, beings their stories are kind of put together in in like and ra- wrapped up in ways which i found very satisfying and interesting um i'm very happy with how this book ended it is very satisfying there are a few things where it's a bit well it's a bit neat but again you've got to finish the book sometime in this case after 900 pages or 45 hours of audiobook yeah you got to wrap it up somewhere so it was good how it didn't drag at the end and i did like that sort of like some some of it was reset sort of like oh these powerful people over here we're going to knock their power down a bit so they're a little bit less powerful otherwise they could be you know it could they could overrun the rest of the book so i kind of like a bit of the resetting at the end of the book so it isn't just sort of like everyone is just getting increasingly more powerful for 12 books in a row and at the end they're just going to be gods punching each other so like no okay we're going to reset this the deck of dragons is going to be thinned out a bit we're going to bring bring some people down a few levels and uh, and obviously set some other people up in the future um but yeah i really enjoy that uh, uh th- i really enjoyed the end of it and and how a lot of the characters and armies and battles were paid off so yeah i've got to the end of my notes otherwise yeah i really 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 enjoyed this book it i can't i don't think i can give it five stars because again it, i think it did overwhelm me a little bit normally i like a book which is very challenging but like i say it felt like it was a, a, it was it bit off it asked me to bite off more than I could chew if I don't have maps and glossaries and reading it as an audiobook it kind of defeated me in some cases I often had to uh, rewind back to the beginning of chapters just to go oh right oh yeah we're here again um, which is good also I, I I did like the the character the chapter introductions there's always those little bits and pieces sort of like an ex- extract from a history book about what you're reading right now and sort of like oh we would have never have guessed that in this case this was going to be I was like oh this is going to be epic um, and I always like that uh, that that playfulness with the pre chapter history e- book extracts that they put in these fantasy books it's done very well here um of course there's loads of other characters that i didn't touch on loads of other events i hardly even touched on the stories just overall but yeah really enjoyed this one so i'm going to give this four and a half stars which is a quite a high rating for a fantasy series and and I think in this case, I'm not going to wait three years to get back into the next book. I think what I'm going to do is my next work trip, whenever that's going to be, uh, you know, March or whenever it's going to be, I think I'm going to load up, um, I'm going to load up this book and uh, put podcasts on on pause for a while, load up the next book in this series and get on with this fantasy series because I don't have any other ongoing fantasy series at the moment, at least not that I can think of. All right, I forgot to plug my laptop in and I've been using it all day and it's down to 17%, so I should probably finish here. The next book that I'm going to review, I've actually finished another book called Artemis by Andy Weir and I was going to review that, um, but I actually said, actually, Juliana, you should read this and I'll be home. Uh, for the first time in seven weeks in about uh, five days. So we're going to review that, so uh, check that out um, in the feed tomorrow or the next day. All these reviews will come out when I get back from Antarctica and have proper internet access anyway. So uh, check out that. And uh, also a new book by Alistair Reynolds, the follow-up from The Prefect. We uh, will be reviewing that probably at the beginning of February. We'll see how that goes. And a few other books that I'm reading at the moment, which uh, I'll see which one I'm going to stick with because uh, after finishing a few audiobooks, I'm taking a bit of a break. Anyway, that's it for me. 
Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Luke Burridge. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Luke Burridge there as well. You can see videos of whales jumping and killer whales and orcas or whatever they're called. Uh, so check check me out on Instagram. I'm Luke Burridge there. Also become my friend on Goodreads. Uh, this is a great way for me to see what you think about this. There's uh, there's actually got quite a lot of ratings. 46 reviews by friends of mine. In other words, listeners to the SFBRP and a 4.29 average rating. Kevin Kevin Zhu rated it five stars. David Sven rated it five stars. Um, Search rated it five stars. Carl Black rated it five stars. Chris rated it five stars. So a lot. Of, oh, Troy G rated it two stars. So not everyone loves it, I guess. Um, but yeah, a lot of people enjoy this book. Um, and from looking and glancing through some of the reviews there, because I just needed to look up some of the spellings and some of the names of people uh, in the book. Yeah, looking through there, it seems like this is generally considered uh, the the best book of the series so far from people who are reading it. Um, the ravaged continent of Genebacchus is a terrifying new empire. Uh, the Panion Domin that devours all. An uneasy alliance resists. One arms army, Whiskey Jack's bridge burners, and former enemies, the war- forces of Warlord Caladan Brood, Anamanda Rake and his Tisty Andy Mages, and the Rivy People of the Plains, and the crippled god intends revenge. In other words, um, uh, you know, proper noun, proper noun, proper, you know, just lots of lots of capital letters there of different words that you've never heard before, but you know m- m- they must mean something. Anyway, that's it for me. Uh, become my friend on Goodreads is what I'm trying to say. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>